The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, At His Father's Right Hand. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee that thou hast accounted us as being joined to Christ, and that thou dost see us perfect in him. May we grow in thy truth is our constant prayer. Cleanse us from every stain of sin through the finished work of the Savior. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In our studies in Romans, we come today to Romans 8.34. Christ also makes intercession for us. He makes intercession for us. He prays for us. He lives in order to pray for us. We recite this indeed in the Apostles' Creed. You know, the men who put the clauses of the Apostles' Creed together were men with deep spiritual insight. The thoughts that are there expressed in a few words are fortresses of great ideas. Every line is pregnant with meaning, and the truths that are involved can be amplified, each one, into a volume of interrelated ideas. Why did the ancient formulators of the Creed take the trouble to say that our Lord Jesus Christ, after he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What is important about Christ's being seated in heaven? All of the present occupation of our Lord is included in that phrase. The great difference between the priesthood of Christ and that of Aaron and his successors is that Christ sat down when he entered heaven. Now, our text today states that Christ is making intercession for us. A parallel verse is in the epistle of the Hebrews and states, Christ is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This leads us then to a discussion of Christ's work for us as a priest, as our great high priest, as the New Testament calls him. Now, the work of a priest in the Bible was twofold. The priest offered a sacrifice for sin, that is, he killed lambs, and he was the mediator between God and man in behalf of the people. We have seen in full in our study of earlier chapters of this epistle the sacrificial work of Christ as our Savior priest. In the Old Testament, the priests offered up the blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. Christ presented himself to us both as the offering and as the offerer. He was both victim and sacrificer. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he came saying, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. In thus offering himself once for all, He completed one phase of his priestly work, and that can never be added to by anything or anybody. This is why we who are evangelical are so insistent on the true nature of the communion service. The bread and the wine of the communion cannot be anything more than symbols through which God conveys to us the spiritual reality of what Christ has done for us. It is a memorial when Christ took the bread and the wine, saying, This is my body, this is my blood, it did not mean that it was his literal body and blood any more than his statement, I am the door, meant that he was the wood and the hinges of a door. It is extraordinary how we human beings can be so obtuse in the understanding of material symbols as being the channels of spiritual truth. Let me show you some illustrations of this failure to understand, as recorded in the gospel according to John. In the second chapter of John, the Lord Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now the listeners were in confusion, thinking he was talking about the masonry of Herod's temple, which took 46 years to erect, but he was talking about the resurrection of his own body. In the third chapter of John, he spoke of the new birth and Nicodemus began to think of obstetrics. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus 
was speaking of spiritual birth and not of carnal birth. To the woman at the well, he spoke of living water, and she thought of the liquid which we know as H2O. He was talking of life from God. When he pressed the illustration further, she thought of plumbing, asking that she be given the water so that she would not have to come down the hill to draw from the well. Later that afternoon, the disciples pressed him to eat, and he replied, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And immediately they began to wonder who had brought him food. Again he spoke of giving them his flesh to eat, and they talked of cannibalism while he was talking of spiritual food. There are other illustrations in the Bible along this same line. Now men have always been the same throughout the centuries. They are slow to understand spiritual truths, and they seek to grasp something with their hands and to hold Christ with their physical senses. This cannot be done. We may not climb the heavenly steeps to bring the Lord Christ down. He himself said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. When we thus understand material illustrations, they can become very, very blessed to us. Now the priestly work of Christ in dying for us on the cross was finished forever at the moment he bowed his head and yielded his spirit back to the Father. And since that work was finished, it would be a terrible thing for us to think that it was incomplete and that we had to do something to prolong it or add to it. And this is why we are more than content to be pastors who feed the flock or ministers who serve in the teaching of the people. When Peter tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, he is not talking about any sacrifice for sin but is setting forth that there is no difference whatsoever in the sight of God between believers, and that there is no difference in God's sight between what we call clergy and laymen. All members of the human race are equal in God's sight, no matter what. A man is a man. We are all cut from the same piece of cloth, though we are overprinted with different designs of culture and education and so on. All members of the human race are equal in God's sight, and with him there is no respect of persons. And all who believe in Jesus Christ become equal before him in the true church, which is the body of all believers, not an organization, but the organism. Our universal priesthood is that grace of God toward us which finds it possible for him to accept a spiritual gift from us, even though he is perfect, and we are sinners by nature. Now, the second phase of Christ's priesthood, in addition to his atoning work in dying for us on the cross, is all that work which he now accomplishes for us at the right hand of God. He is our mediator, and the only mediator that can exist between God and man. It is because Christ has died for us that we have access to pray directly lay to the Father through Christ. No one can get to the Father except through Christ and Christ alone. It follows that prayers through any but Christ are superfluous, and that if we come through him, we may be sure of being received. Now let us look at these three propositions. First, no one can get to the Father except through Christ. Jesus did not say, I am one of many equally good ways. I am a phase of truth. I am an aspect of life. He said flatly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, we dare to say that biblical Christianity is the exclusive, final, and absolute religion, because if this be not so, we are forced to say that Christianity is utter nonsense and must be cast aside as spurious. It is all or nothing at all. Every attempt to compromise with these truths leads us to a watering down of the truth that leaves us with something quite other than Christianity. Jesus Christ, with God the Father, occupies a solitary throne. He will not share it with any other, no matter what the title. There can be no co-mediator. There was no co-redeemer, and there never will be. 
It is for this reason that we must realize that much prayer that is offered up from this earth does not go to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, said Jesus Christ. So it follows our second proposition that prayers through any but him are superfluous. In one of my earlier books, I tell a story of a conversation which I had when I was a young student minister in southern France. I was living in one of the Alpine valleys, preaching to a group of little Huguenot congregations while I was pursuing my studies in the University of Grenoble. Every Thursday, I had occasion to walk four miles up the valley to a little center where I instructed a score of children in the things of God. There was a man that lived there who made the same trip in the opposite direction on that same day of the week, and inevitably we met in the center of the valley and chatted for a few minutes before going on our respective ways. One day he said to me, Why do you object so strongly to our praying to the saints? I asked him to explain what advantage there was in praying to anyone other than God and in coming to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He replied, Well, uh, suppose, for example, that I wanted an interview with the President of the Republic, Monsieur Raymond Poincaré. I could go to Paris and arrange for an interview through any one of the members of the cabinet. I could go to the Minister of Agriculture, or to the Minister for the Colonies, or to the Office of the Interior, the Navy, National Defense, or any other of the ministries, and they would facilitate my obtaining an interview with the President. In the same way, I may obtain the intercession of the Virgin and the Saints on behalf of my desires as I pray. He looked rather triumphantly at me as he completed his illustration. And then I said to him, Monsieur, let me ask you a question. Suppose that my name is Poincaré and that my father is the president of the French Republic. Suppose that I live in the palace of the Élysée with him, sit at his table three times a day, and know the touch of his loving hand. Do you think for a moment that if I have a problem to present to him, my father, that I'm going to go across Paris to one of the ministries, pass all the guards and secretaries that surround a cabinet member, and finally reaching his office, only because it is known that I am the son of the president, say to him, Monsieur le Ministre, would you be so kind as to arrange an interview for me to talk with my daddy? Do you not rather think that I will look my father in the eye at one of the moments when he puts his arm across my shoulder in a gesture of affection and then tell him that I have a request to make? This gentleman was taken aback. He looked at me, and his mouth opened and closed and opened again as though he were seeking for words that would not come. Then I took my little French New Testament from my pocket and turned to two or three passages of Scripture and had him read them aloud to me. To as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access, by faith, into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, apart from sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, how wonderful it is for me to know that I have complete and ready access to my heavenly Father at any moment through Jesus Christ. At any time and in any place I may go to the Father, knowing that with Jesus Christ as my one mediator, I will be instantly received. I am a child of the King. I have become, at the very moment of my new birth, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So we come to the conclusion that there is no access to God apart from Christ. Through the plain teaching of the Bible, and because there is no line of Bible teaching that even hints that anyone who has ever been on this earth and who has then died can hear the voice of anyone who yet remains on this earth. 
Now, further, if we are honest with the plain words that were given to us by Jesus Christ, we are forced to admit that while he was here on earth, he announced that he would never be moved by any intercession on the part of a member of his family. Jesus was not to be approached by brother, sister, or mother. The story that precedes the setting forth of this truth is found near the end of the 12th chapter of Matthew. Christ had been preaching to the people of Israel, and he spoke very sharply against the leaders who had led the people astray. He called men by the worst names that have ever been addressed to others. No one in all history has been able to go beyond the terrible things that Jesus Christ called these men. He had called them dirty graveyards, clean on the outside but full of dead men's bones. He had called them generation of vipers, which came to them as the whip of a lash, you son of a snake, would be an adequate translation of the passage. The leaders drew back from him, cut to the quick, and with the determination that he should be murdered, for we read that they took counsel against him, how they might destroy him. Finally, someone approached him. Timidly, they told him that his, his mother and his brothers were outside. Now, if they had thought Christ beside himself before that, what were they to think now? For he answered with what must be called insanity or deity. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now, that's Jesus speaking. He is saying, I will not tolerate being approached by an earthly relationship. And then Jesus continued, you read it in Matthew 12 at the end of the chapter, pointing to those who stood around him, perhaps extending his finger to touch grizzled bearded Peter, and said, Behold my mother and my brothers. For whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my mother, my sister, and my brother. As plainly as plain words can be spoken, the Lord Jesus said that no one was ever to approach him pleading the intercession of a member of his family. He denied that he could be reached through any earthly relationship. Now, if we understand heavenly things, we will have no difficulty in accepting that truth. Christ is all-sufficient. But though there are examples of people who approached Christ through his mother and were refused, we know that no one can approach Christ directly and be refused. And this leads us to that third proposition, that if you come through Jesus Christ, you will be heard, you will be met by him, because he lives to intercede for us. Remember that Jesus Christ is the one who is love, and that he is closer to us than breathing, and nearer than hands and feet. He knows us completely, and he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You do not have a problem too great for the power of Christ. You do not have a problem too complicated for the wisdom of Christ. You do not have a problem too small for the love of Christ. You do not have a sin too deep for the atoning blood of Christ. You do not have a sorrow that is beyond the consolation of Christ. One of the most wonderful phrases ever spoken about Jesus is that which is found on several occasions in the Gospels. It is that Jesus was moved with compassion. He loved men and women. He loves you. You have a problem, he can meet it. It does not matter what it is. The moment that the problem comes to you in your life, he knows all about it. For if there is a fear in your heart, it is immediately known to him. If there is a sorrow in your heart, it is immediately a sorrow to his heart. If there is a bereavement in your life or any other emotion that comes to any child of God, all of these, the same sorrow, grief, or bereavement, are immediately written on the heart of Christ. For we find written in the word of God, in all their afflictions he was afflicted. Now this great truth stands in relationship with every member of the human race. If you will not have Jesus Christ as your savior and your mediator, your intercessor, you must one day have him as your judge. God is not mocked. Every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ. I know that I have gladly and willingly bowed to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that as a result, I have become the object of all the love and affection and solicitude of the Godhead. 
But if you will not bow willingly, there must come the day when you will be taken bodily by the angels of God and hurled to your knees in enforced submission before you are banished forever to the outer darkness away from his presence. But if you have bowed before God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then know that even now the Lord Jesus Christ is seated upon the throne of God, occupied with nothing other than your best interests. We might think it strange if the President of the United States met with the Prime Minister of Britain and the heads of other states and spent a large amount of time discussing, a, for example, a common standard of wage payments in the various capitals of the world. There would be many who would think that these men, in positions of great power, should spend their time on more important things, things that affect the peace of the world and the flow of history. And in like manner, it might be thought strange that the Lord Jesus Christ should be on the throne of heaven considering the matters that are now before him. Yet the Bible shows us that he is not now concerning himself with the great plans of governments and the movements of the nations. These things have been planned before the foundation of the world and have been written down in their permanent form. Nothing can change the course of events that God has determined for this earth. But the wonderful fact is that Christ has all the time in the world, yes, and all the time in heaven, to be occupied with the flood of his love towards those whom he redeemed with the price of his blood. Have you tears today? Bring them to Christ. He lives to wipe them from your eyes and to give you the comfort of his love. Have you fallen into sin today? Bring your sin to Christ. He lives to cleanse you from sin by the word of his faithfulness on the basis of the price which he paid for your redemption. Have you any other need, no matter how great or how trivial? If you will bow your heart and lift the voice of your thought in even the tiniest whisper of true prayer to him, he will answer you with the manifestation of his love and will break through all the barriers that have been set around you by Satan or erected by your own willfulness. If you will draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. He has promised it, and he is not a liar. Lord our God, we pray thee to bless the truth to every heart and use it to thine honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.